tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We right now show some concerning upward bending of our curve, upward trends. Worrying weekend, a big spike in new cases of COVID-19 also. I can't breathe in it when I wear it. To wear or not to wear, the mask debate divides British Columbians and. If you are under 19, it is not harm reduction, it is just harm. Strict new rules as BC cracks down on vaping. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. A stern warning tonight from BC's top doctor. The province's COVID-19 curve is bending back upwards and we are sitting at a tipping point. That is Dr. Bonnie Henry's assessment as the province announces a concerning 102 new cases of COVID-19 over the last three days of reporting. The Friday to Saturday period saw 51 new cases. Saturday to Sunday, 19. And from Sunday to today, 32. Our Tanya Fletcher joins us live now to break down those new numbers. So Tanya, this has our province positioned at a tipping point, how so? Yeah, that's right, Leanne. So the surge in cases over the weekend comes alongside the potential for explosive growth in COVID-19 cases. And Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry issued a warning, and it was blunt. She said, we are at a turning point in our province's pandemic. Now, BC is teetering right on the edge, and our curve, as you mentioned, is starting to bend upwards, and that is serving as a warning. The warning signs are evident in the updated epidemiological modeling that came today, and specifically around what's called the reproductive rate. Remember, this is the one that shows if I have the virus, how many other people am I infecting? So take a look at this slide here. So if you look at the dotted horizontal line kind of right through the middle of your screen, that's the threshold for how many other people each infected person is transmitting the virus to. Now, up until really June, that number was at one right on that line, which is considered kind of the safety zone. That was the goal. But you can see recently towards the right, that purple line has started to rise, meaning each case is now infecting more than one other person. Health Minister Adrian Dick says that's a problem. The reproductive rate is higher than one, and we have to together do something about that because there is a point at which if we continue to have more contacts, that the, the challenge becomes very significant to contact tracing. So we have to see that. And even if there were not a significant number of cases over the last three days, the fact that that rate is going up over the period leading into this time would be a cause for concern. Now, of particular concern is the number of new cases in young adults resulting from parties and big gatherings. Keep in mind, 60 cases have now been linked to multiple exposure events in Kelowna over the Canada Day long weekend. Wow. Okay, so Tanya, given the new uh, modeling data today, what might the chances be that we could start to see uh, restrictions tighten up again? Well, it would take a lot to reverse our reopening course, and it sounds like there may be a readjustment of sorts around certain sectors instead. Now, the province is currently taking a look at what measures would make the most difference in the most high-risk setting. So right now, that's restaurants and pubs and bars where people are, are congregating. And Dr. Henry says they're also widening the scope to consider where else these gatherings are happening. And they're often at resorts or rental properties or we know, uh, uh, particularly in the interior, um, renting houseboats and boats are a popular thing. Um, can we put in measures that put the onus on the rental agency to ensure that these types of parties aren't happening or that numbers are smaller or that we can work together to put in place the restrictions that we need? So we're looking at a whole bunch of those things. And she had some of those things will come into play this week, so we'll be watching for updates around that. Now, I asked if messaging has been lost maybe around the personal bubbles. Remember, we're supposed to keep all our circles to up to six people. But if that's the root of the problem, more and more people gathering, is there a chance she'd make that number even smaller? Here's what she said. I do think we are um, having larger numbers around us, and that's one of the things that we're seeing with this uh, uh, clusters of cases that we're seeing coming out of linked to these parties in Kelowna. So yes, we've expanded our bubble, and we want to take that into those inside places like restaurants and pubs where, um, where we know it puts people at risk, including the people who are working there. So those are the things that we need to find our balance again. 
And she also points out we are traveling more around the province and that can take us out of the routine, of course, where we're used to in our home settings and taking those proper precautions. So despite, yes, some sobering numbers today, she's confident we can stay on track without going off the rails too quickly and having to clamp back down on restrictions. Leanne, Mike. Yeah, a lot to soak in. All right, Tanya, thanks very much. And more on COVID-19, Earl's Restaurants confirms three employees who work at the Port Coquitlam location have tested positive. They are now self-isolating at home. What's concerning is that Earl's Restaurant says all staff members were temperature checked upon arrival at the restaurant, but they did not show any symptoms. The three workers were, according to the restaurant, wearing personal protective equipment. They've closed temporarily for a complete deep sanitation of the property. The restaurant chain says they're working with Fraser Health Authority, and they say that the risk to the public is low. Well, we know there are no mandatory laws requiring us to wear face masks in B.C., but a new poll finds a majority of people support their use indoors where distancing isn't possible. Now, despite that, almost half of Canadians polled admitted they rarely, if ever, wear a mask. Our Deborah Goebel set out to find out why. I can't breathe in it when I wear it. And I have a really good mask. I just, I can't. It really bothers me. There are a lot of reasons for disliking masks. I think it's necessary because of what we're in right now. Yeah, is it comfortable? Uh, no. <laughs> the discomfort of having cloth or paper covering the bottom half of your face is something a lot of us are trying very hard to get used to. We think it's important to wear masks. I just think it's a considerate thing to do. Yeah. To your daughter? It is. Can I ask you, how do you feel about wearing masks? Uh, I feel good about it, so we don't spread COVID-19. Health experts now say the evidence is clear. Masks do help stop the novel coronavirus by preventing droplets from spreading through the air and infecting people. Yet many are still confused. Part of it has to do with the guidance we're getting from the health authorities. Way back in February, the health authorities were adamant they were telling people don't wear a mask. It's probably not going to help you to wear a mask out in public if you're not sick yourself. The flip-flop messaging hasn't helped, but that's not the only reason people don't wear them. The main reasons they give is they forget it's uncomfortable, they don't see themselves as being, as being susceptible. You know, the, the young immortals think it's okay to not wear a mask. Still, even they can be persuaded. Peer pressure, for example, can be very effective. The more people wear, I feel the more everyone else will feel, OK, I think we should be wearing, because you start feeling like the odd one out. A little bit of worst case scenario can also work as long as you give people a way to avoid it. You know, just to get them to take this seriously, generating a little bit of fear, you should be a, have some anxiety about COVID-19, and here's what you can do. Wear a mask, wash your hands. But some people just don't buy it. Thank you all, you great freedom fighters. This weekend, rallies were held across Canada by people who believe no government should have the power to make mask wearing mandatory. I believe there is no pandemic and there never was. It's a simulation. It's an exercise. I've kind of come to this point in my life where anytime somebody asks me to do something with my body that feels uncomfortable, is a hard no, it's wrong. So I just wanted to show up today to show support for freedom of choice. There is a small, highly vocal minority that they are the you're not the boss of me type person. They are allergic to being told what to do. They have this phenomenon called psychological reactance. So when authorities tell them to do something, they, they feel their, um, their liberties impinged upon, they react uh, with a, big, a strong pushback. But they are the minority, about as many as there are who enjoy wearing one. I feel great wearing a mask. I just wish everybody would, particularly on public transport, because then I would take it. The rest of us are probably somewhere in the middle. We just try to out what would you want someone else to do for you is what you're doing for others. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, West Vancouver. A new poll suggests most British Columbians approve of the province's COVID-19 response so far and also support rebuilding BC's economy to be more equitable than it was before the pandemic. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives study showed 77% of respondents feel the government is on the right track. 
Though it should be noted, the poll was conducted before the province forecast its $12.5 billion deficit. In terms of support for economic change, 83% of respondents support a transition into universal public senior care. 77% support paid sick time for all workers and 67% support increasing social assistance rates to above the poverty line. Four months into the COVID-19 pandemic, some countries have largely contained it. Others seem to be spiraling out of control, a deeply unstable situation that only heightens the need for a vaccine. One candidate from Oxford University is now showing great promise, but as Renee Filipponi reports, there are no guarantees. Rolling up a sleeve for science, more than a thousand people took part in the Oxford vaccine trial. We're seeing both neutralizing antibody responses and T cell responses that we are optimistic may be associated with protection. Which means the vaccine may not only block COVID infections, but help the immune system fight it. Weeks after vaccination, researchers saw peaks in antibodies and T cells, which neutralize pathogens and kill infected host cells. What's not clear is how long those will last. The difficulty that we have is that we don't know how strong that immune response needs to be. So now it's on to a phase three trial, which is much larger and will determine whether or not it's truly effective. That will happen in places like Brazil, which has the world's second highest infection rate. This virologist is optimistic. This is quite important to see if the vaccine is uh, uh, efficacious in protecting from infection or protecting from disease and this will be crucial and uh, unfortunately we need to wait. Life is coming back to the streets of London but experts say it won't return to normal until there is a reliable and widely available vaccine and that's unlikely to happen this year. There are 22 other vaccines in the clinical trial phase around the world, including one here at Imperial College in London. PH might be different. The project leader says it's important to have lots because many will fail and because scaling up production will take time. We still need to be aware that there may be a big gap between the announcement of a success in, in a vaccine uh, to making it available to different parts of the world. The UK government is attempting to get a jump start, already placing orders for 190 million doses of three different vaccines, including the one from Oxford. None have been proven effective yet. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Tensions between staff at a BC fishing lodge and a local First Nation have hit our coastal waters, and the RCMP says it's going to be taking a closer look at video of a recent confrontation. And Dan Burt joins us live with more now. So, Dan, what is this dispute, first of all, about? COVID-19, Leanne and Mike. Tensions are up on Haida Gwaii since the Queen Charlotte Lodge, a luxury fishing destination, reopened despite a state of emergency in the Haida Nation. The nation and other local leaders have asked non-essential travelers not to visit right now. That tension led to some close calls in the water. This video appears to show about five boats from the lodge passing too close to a pair of smaller Haida boats. It's believed to have happened on Friday and an edited video was posted online on Sunday by a group of Haida matriarchs known as Daughters of the Rivers. A member claims it illustrates how fishing lodges view the Haida people as an inconvenience and put profit over safety. The nation president says they're trying to protect their elders. They have limited health equipment on the island if someone gets infected with COVID and they think the fishing lodges ought not to reopen. One exchange between Haida boats and lodge vessels was especially heated. The RCMP aren't coming. The Coast Guard's not coming. If you guys get hurt, it's going to be a real problem. Who's going to hurt us? You're running in front of our boats. We're not. This, this is Haida territory. Haida lodge. You know what? When you're a you sovereign guys, state you have the right and you can run water. your own island properly. Sounding like a whole lot of white privilege there. Okay, so Dan, what does Dan, uh, sorry, what does the lodge have to say about that video and that encounter? Well, the lodge vice president says Haida Nation members have been fishing near the lodge most days since the opening and workers make sure they pass safely. He says he's seen the video and doesn't think the lodge's boats were too close. He says the lodge is following all the provincial rules. As for what the man behind the wheel of the lodge boat said. You could interpret what Matt was saying as um, antagonistical. 
uh, and even maybe threatening, or you can interpret it that he's just saying, you know, guys, someone's going to get hurt if we don't all just, you know, be smarter out here. And uh, and that's what I think was trying. He was trying to come across was it the wisest thing to do with someone recording it, but it's there, it exists, um, and it was care and concern for the folks that are up there. On Friday, Haida Nation officials said there was a self-reported case of COVID-19 from a resident. And as you mentioned, the RCMP says it wants to end things peacefully. It will review all the video of the incident it can find, speak with all the sides, and talk with Transport Canada to see if someone broke any rules. Leanne, Mike? All right, thank you so much for that, Dan Burt, reporting for us tonight. Abbotsford police say an officer critically injured last Thursday while off-duty in Nelson is not expected to survive. 55-year-old Constable Alan Young remi remains on life support at a hospital in the interior. Few details have been released, but Nelson police confirmed their officers responded to a disturbance in downtown Nelson. Young was rushed to hospital while a 26-year-old man was arrested. And sweeping new regulations on vaping products were announced today, some calling it a necessity to protect young people. But others say this could take away a potential harm reduction tool for those who need it. As Zara Premji reports tonight, despite the new rules, the vaping debate isn't letting up. When it comes to smoking a cigarette, the harm is on the label, a harm that educator and father Baljeet Renu is trying to put a stop to. A major part is getting parents involved. Um, we have um, at Clayton a number of parents who gave their kids vapes because they said it's not as harmful as smoking it. When it comes to vaping, experts like Dr. Chris Carlston say the advertising is not as clear, even when the reality is. And vaping is continuing to be a huge problem. The, the vaping rates amongst youth continue to increase. And according to the Canadian Cancer Society, vaping among young people rose by 74% between 2017 and 2018. New regulations have been in the works to address this since last year. NBC's health and education ministers have come together to say COVID-19 delayed the implementation, but the wait can't go on. If you are a young person, if you are under 19, it is not harm reduction, it is just harm. When, when people are addicted to nicotine, they are at the mercy of that nicotine and we have to speak to that. The sale of non-tobacco flavors will be in adult-only stores, as well as packaging will remain plain with health warnings on the labels. Now, Minister Dick says the nicotine level will drop down to 20 milligrams, which is the equivalent to 20 cigarettes. And new retailers will be required to comply immediately with the new rules, while existing retailers will have until September 15th to make the changes. For Stacey White, this could be another big hit to her business. We are strictly vapor related products, so it is going to have a very big impact on us because a large portion of our stock is going to become obsolete. It's not a necessity. Um, I have no issue if the if vape stores close down. Um, you're providing a service to people that isn't required for life. And White says she's all for protecting the kids, but she doesn't want to see the potential harm reduction avenue difficult to get to. Because I do think that you need to make sure that you aren't harming um, access to people who really could have life-saving, life-changing experiences um, and benefits. These new rules come after a series of respiratory illnesses connected to vaping were reported across North America. And as of April 7th, 19 cases of the illness had been identified in Canada, including five in BC. Zara Premji, CBC News, North Vancouver. Well, the weekend's warm, sunny weather had a lot of us enjoying the great outdoors, but it also meant a very busy time for volunteer rescue teams. North Shore Rescue responded to a call Saturday morning and four more calls yesterday. Lions Bay Search and Rescue also helped out with two stranded hikers. It's been a very busy month, in fact, for teams across the province. Crews have been called to 110 rescues so far this month. That's a 50 percent jump over last July, according to the BC Search and Rescue Association. And from rescue calls to close calls, incredibly, nobody was hurt in this six-vehicle crash on the Trans-Canada Highway near Salmon Arm. At one moment in the distance, a semi-tractor trailer is negotiating a curve in the oncoming lane, but the truck suddenly tips over its side with the trailer falling right into the path of four vehicles. The RCMP say it's extremely fortunate that no one died in this crash. The driver has been charged with crossing over the center line under the Motor Vehicle Act.
And Johanna Wagstaff's here with our first check of the forecast. This is uh, usually the time for my annual plea for us to get uh, air conditioning <laughs> in the house. It always uh, invariably fails, but man, it was, it's, it's a warm one today. Yeah, if you had the AC, it was probably pumping today and yesterday as well. Yesterday and today, sort of the peak of the heat and the sunshine. Surprisingly though, we didn't break any records and we have yet to hit that 25 degree mark in 3YVR. Again, latest in two decades uh, that we've made it through summer season without hitting uh, 25. We've got a 23 right now at uh, YVR, but check out when I factor in the humidity, more like a 28. I've got a lot of excited people behind me about this Humidex. Uh, 28 in YVR, feeling like a 33 in through Nanaimo, 36 uh, out towards Abbotsford. So yeah, it is sticky and hot, but again, not quite record breaking uh, from the numbers I've seen so far. That's high pressure building across the south half, half of the province. That's what we've had in place for the past few days. Very different story if you're in the north. Uh, notice that cold front draped across the province. Prince George getting some showers right now. That will ride up against the dome of high pressure, but I think we'll stay dry and warm and mainly sunny for the next few days. We'll just see temperatures drop a couple of degrees or two as we head into the forecast. So we get to keep the sunshine and keep the summer weather, uh, but we lose a bit of that humidity over the next couple of days. I'll break it down coming up. All right, thank you so much, Joe. We'll check in with you in a little bit. <laughs> the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra is refusing to call the season over because of COVID-19. We found ways despite this global pandemic. pandemic. In fact, music has become the antidote to COVID-19. It's become the counterpoint to COVID-19 because it brings us joy, beauty, and hope. It certainly does. The VSO's president has been finding new ways to go forward with the season while keeping everyone safe. So far, that's included more streaming digital concerts, playing without an audience, and support from government fans and sponsors. Now there are plans to get back into the theater with 28 musicians safely physically distanced. The VSO's home theater, the Orpheum, has been closed since March 15th. Dang, nice to see that again. Mm -hmm. Well, a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can also follow both of us and Johanna and perhaps that baby that was running behind her on Instagram as well. <laughs> The three people killed in a bus crash in Alberta have now been identified, but it's not clear what caused the ice explorer to roll over on the Columbia ice field. But investigators are saying, coming up. And thanks for staying with us online during the TV commercial break. A new study is showing how COVID-19 may impact the rest of the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. Dalhousie University looked at how the virus impacts cats, dogs, and other animals. And as John Tatry tells us, the findings could be important for zoos and for pet owners. Most of us have been focused on the human side of COVID-19. But Sabi Mathavaraja has spent the past few months studying how it impacts cats and dogs and other creatures. From our study, we were able to determine that uh, essentially that the differences between the cat and dog receptor that the virus targets uh, contributes to the susceptibility of the virus. And we determined that along with cats, a number of different feline species, cheetahs, leopards, tigers and lions are all predicted to be susceptible to the virus. The PhD student at Dalhousie University took Chinese research in a new direction. While cats are vulnerable, he found dogs and bears are not. It turns out that a single amino acid, which is what comprises a receptor, contributes to the susceptibility. So that single change or that single mutation is what uh, conferred resistance for dogs, for example, but not cats, to the virus. Mathavaraja says cats don't get sick like humans do, but they can carry the virus. It's found in their respiratory droplets. It's not clear yet if humans can get the virus from cats. So no masks for cats just yet but testing strays could be a way to track the virus's spread. If you're a zoo, you have to start you know, thinking about this, maybe testing your animals, testing the people who work with these animals, and maybe restricting access. So these are all ways we can protect these animals as well as ourselves. Dr. Graham Dallaire is a professor in pathology at Dalhousie and oversaw the study. He says the evolutionary past can help us understand the present. Bats, for example, can carry the virus, but don't get sick. 
organisms have co-evolved with the pathogens that infect them. And so bats are very highly adapted to coronavirus. In fact, many viruses, bats carry Ebola, bats carry influenza, bats carry rabies. And you know, how can one organism be so resistant uh, to being infected with so many different pathogens? Learning why may help humans fight this virus. John Tatry, CBC News, Halifax. And to leave you with something else that's quite sweet before we're back, it is National Lollipop Day in the U.S., so if you're looking for an excuse to indulge your sweet tooth, now you have it. An American candy maker is credited with coming up with the name Lollipop back in 1931, but here's some food for thought. It's believed ancient Egyptian and Chinese cultures created some of the earliest versions using just nuts and berries covered in honey. Yeah, so that sounds like they were the original developers of these fantastic little treats, right? Yes, and yesterday was National Ice Cream Day. I'm an even bigger <laughs> fan of that. How do you do that back to back? Ice cream one day and <laughs> lollipops the next. You have to get in on the sweet action, right? Good deal. There you go. All right, uh, stay with us back in just a couple of seconds. Uh, more COVID-19 news from around the world and across the country. And we'll have the latest on that deadly Alberta bus crash. Back in seconds. I'm CBC journalist Will Fundal, and I'm non-binary. But what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. Listen now. We are learning more tonight about the victims of Saturday's deadly bus crash in Alberta's Jasper National Park and more, too, about the scene right after the crash happened. Two people who were right there tell us what it was like after. Rafi Bujakanyan spoke with them and has the details. At the scene of the crash, crews are moving the wreckage slowly. The area of the crash is very steep, very dangerous for the responders, for the crews that are coming in to remove it. But images of the crash itself are seared into the minds of witnesses. There's a lot of injuries. There was a lot of blood. Um, people were screaming. These two friends were on another bus nearby. They raced to the scene to try to help. There was a old mom on the ground uh, laying down, just calling for her daughter. And uh, I went around the bus uh, and I saw about... Uh, Four more people just uh, badly injured. Strangers delivered first aid and helped any way they could. So I picked up about four phones, about five wallets, and I put them in a bag and I gave it to the man in charge and he told me that I was a good man apparently. Yeah. But Sahim says there was only so much he could do. There was a couple who was on the ground too. The guy was holding her girlfriend or his wife on his hands and her girlfriend was, uh, uh, had her last breaths at that moment, and she passed away right in front of my eyes. And the guy's reaction was, um, he was screaming, he was in pain, he was, uh, he was praying, I, don't, I couldn't help him at all. Police have released new details about the three passengers who died. A 24-year-old woman from Canoe Narrow, Saskatchewan, a 28-year-old woman from Edmonton, and a 58-year-old man from India. I wasn't told to cover up the bodies, but in common human decency, I went and uh, covered up their bodies uh, with the blankets. And that was the CBC's Rafi Bujakanyan reporting. The flight recorders from the Ukraine Airlines jet that was shot down in Iran six months ago, killing 176 people, including Canadians, are now being examined in France. Canada's Transportation Safety Board has two investigators in Paris observing the analysis, and the TSB confirms that data from the cockpit voice recorder has been successfully downloaded. Iran admits it accidentally shot down the passenger jet shortly after it took off from Tehran on January 8th. Those who died included 55 Canadians, 30 permanent residents, and several people who were heading to Canada as their final destination. In Quebec today, a funeral for two young sisters who disappeared nearly two weeks ago. Their bodies were found in a wooded area not far from Quebec City. 
And as Jayla Bernstein reports, the hunt for their father, who police believe abducted them, intensified today. Nous avons eu que trop peu de temps. Two lives cut short inexplicably. 11-year-old Noha Carpentier and her little sister, 6-year-old Romy. This man helped search for them. That's sad. Very sad. Others from the area, many complete strangers, came to pay their respects. Noha was a Cub Scout and Homi was about to become a Beaver Scout. They were last seen alive with their father at a convenience store. Shortly after, their car was found crashed and abandoned. Three days later, the bodies of the two girls were found in the woods. Their father is still missing more than a week later. He says the story deeply touched him. He lives nearby and says it's terrible what happened. Today's service was a celebration of life. They wanted to uh, really put the focus on the life and the joy, the happiness, the brightness that the girls brought throughout their life. She says she told the family she would handle things as if it were her own family and her own daughters. It's the kind of call that you always wish you're never going to get. Um, just because, not because you know you can't do it, because of course we always can, but just on a human point of view. While family and friends honor the girl's memory, there are still many questions left unanswered. Questions police hope will be answered by Martin Carpentier if he's found. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Levy. And we have some breaking news on that story for you. Just a short time ago, the Quebec Provincial Police announced they believe they found the body of Martin Carpentier. Police believe Carpentier took his own life. And escalating tensions in Portland between local authorities and the White House tonight. The president says he sent in enforcements to restore order because state and city officials aren't doing enough. As Salima Shivji reports, Trump says he'll send agents to other cities as well. A chaotic weekend in Portland. Tear gas. And anger against federal forces boiling over. These moms say they mobilized to protect protesters from federal officers. I think what they want to do is scare us away, the feds. They want us to stop protesting, and it's the opposite effect. Their presence irking local officials, too. It's not helping the situation at all. They're not wanted here. We haven't asked them here. In fact, we want them to leave. Oregon officials, all Democrats, are threatening to sue the Department of Homeland Security and other federal agencies for overreach and violating civil rights. And they're accusing the White House of using the city as a pawn in a political game to rally Donald Trump's base. Portland is currently the poster child for this administration. Uh, they are using us, sort of throwing mud on the wall to see if this is an issue that might stick for the president. The president today is not backing down. People say protesters, these people are anarchists. Donald Trump insisting Portland authorities weren't up to the task after weeks of nightly protests. And so the federal government had to intervene. The president says he won't hesitate to send federal forces elsewhere to New York or Chicago, where gun violence is up. This is worse than Afghanistan, by far. This is worse than anything anyone's ever seen. All run by the same liberal Democrats. And you know what? If Biden got in, that would be true for the country. The whole country would go to hell. A key Trump campaign message with the election less than four months away, law and order. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington. Well, the Prime Minister is taking a day off, but members of the opposition are still going after Justin Trudeau. They want to know more about his personal connections to the Weed Charity, that organization the government asked to manage a student grant program. As David Cochran reports tonight, another Commons committee has started hearing from witnesses within that WE program. The Prime Minister didn't recuse himself from the WE charity decision, but he did excuse himself from the first WE question period. I guess he needed another long weekend. Why is the Prime Minister taking a personal day? And I'd like to ask the Deputy Prime Minister, is everything okay? Leaving it to the Deputy Prime Minister to defend the government. Part of my job is to be accountable to this chamber when the Prime Minister is not here. It's either corruption or incompetence. Which is it? Mr. Speaker, it is neither. As Parliament resumed to approve more pandemic aid, yet another House committee started hearing witnesses on the WE charity program. Will the government admit 
that this wasn't about helping students, this was about helping their close friends. The controversy has infused Every politics into the pandemic response. The While there have been disagreements on the scope and scale of government aid programs, the personal nature of the WE controversy gives this a different feel. Justin Trudeau cannot hide from this scandal. He didn't make a mistake, he made a choice. To hand almost a billion dollars to a charity that has paid multiple members of his immediate family almost $300,000. Now a new poll suggests it is hurting the Liberals. Support for Justin Trudeau's government soared when the pandemic response was seen as driven by public health concerns. Now a dip with the whiff of personal and partisan interests surrounding the $900 million student grants program. Justin Trudeau said last week he was looking forward to taking questions on the WE controversy when Parliament resumed. But Justin Trudeau took a personal day today. He's expected to be back in Parliament on Tuesday. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The need to wear masks indoors is creating new hurdles for those who read lips. Clear masks are one solution, but that's not the only challenge. We'll have that story coming up. All the eyes have been dotted, the T's crossed. Tonight, the same-sex marriage bill has gone through the last of the formalities and become the law of the land. Everyone knew this would happen, so while it doesn't come as a surprise, it does represent a significant change that can now be found in every corner of the country. The CBC's Paul Hunter reports. Our wedding will be fun. Engaged to be legally married, two men in Alberta, Mickey and Aaron Wilson, now planning their wedding here. For them, this is a happy day indeed. I am happy to say that uh, my government has uh, included me in uh, side of a, uh, a tradition that's, that's remarkably life affirming. Canada's Senate formally approved legislation late last night changing the definition of marriage in this country from the union of a man and a woman to the union of two persons. And at the Supreme Court today, royal assent. We're gathered together here to... Though it had been allowed in most provinces already anyway, it means, as of now, gays and lesbians anywhere in Canada can get married. It's just the fourth country in the world to allow it, underscoring a sea change in Canadian society. Just four decades ago, homosexuals faced social and legal persecution, not to mention puzzlement. Have you ever tried to do anything about uh, your condition, medically or clinically? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I haven't because I'm quite well happy with it. A turning point when then-Justice Minister Pierre Trudeau decriminalized homosexuality in the late 60s. There's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. And though the path since to fuller acceptance has been at times rancorous, Canada's current Justice Minister, speaking today from Israel, called the new marriage legislation a model for the world. I would say that Canada is a, a leader, and I think 10 years from now when we will look back at this, uh, we will say, you know, uh, they did the right thing, maybe a little bit ahead of their time. But the debate may not yet be over. The Conservative opposition, worried religious rights are threatened, insists it will revisit the matter. Mr. Harper has said that we will have a free vote on this under a Conservative government. Still, for those who fought for what Canada has now put into law, victory at last. And, says this man, pride. I felt just incredibly proud to be a Canadian, to live in a country that values all of its citizens and that practices things like inclusion and respect. And so for gays and lesbians, the right to be married is now the law of the land. Could it all be reversed by a future government? Yes, says the current one, if a future prime minister chose to override Canada's Charter of Rights, something no prime minister has ever done. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Ottawa.
some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It is a significant step forward and I am truly hopeful that it's going to make a, a big impact. Doctors and advocates are optimistic about the BC government's strict new rules on vaping. Non-tobacco flavors will be restricted to adult-only stores. Limits are being placed on advertising and the amount of nicotine in vapor pods, all in hopes of keeping it out of the hands of young people. We must acknowledge that the number of new cases reported over the last three days is concerning. We have not had uh, 100 cases um, reported in a single time period. A worrying surge in new COVID-19 cases over the weekend in BC. Dr. Bonnie Henry is warning of the potential for explosive growth of the virus if we're not careful. While there were 102 new cases over the past three days, there were no new deaths in our province. And as we told you earlier tonight, Dr. Henry revealed the results of an online survey about the impact of COVID-19 here in BC. A few months ago, nearly 400,000 people answered questions about their mental and financial well-being. Greg Rasmussen looks at the results and who has been most affected. The survey taps into what's going on behind those masks and barriers, how people have been dealing with the realities of COVID-19. People are out and about and getting some sunshine, but um, I do think people are hesitant to move forward with what they would normally do uh, in the summer. The psychological impact of the virus is a huge concern. 52% of families with children reported worsening mental health, with 24% reporting extreme stress and 36% saying they've been drinking more alcohol. Whether that was anxiety, concern about the virus, fear about losing their job, fear about um, being able to care for their families. Younger people, 18 to 29, reported even higher levels of mental health problems. We both lost our jobs at the beginning of it and we haven't had them back yet. I live by myself and for the first like March to May it was really hard to get outside but then it's still now it's like well I don't have a job still. That young people bore a greater proportion of the the mental health and economic burden than older adults and this may in part be because the pandemic has impacted many of the occupations that they work in. Overall economic worries have been a big concern. 31% said it's been tougher meeting financial needs, 15% were worried they wouldn't have enough to eat and 1 in 20 said they would likely have to move out of their current home. The survey also reveals that most have accepted the need to practice preventative hygiene. I never really changed much. I don't know, I'm a pretty clean person. I always wash my hands and I don't know, I work in a very sterile environment. In all, a survey revealing a mix of fear and anxiety, but with some hope for the future. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. In some places, the mandatory use of masks during COVID-19 is causing a serious problem for those who read lips to communicate. And there are growing concerns that a simple solution, clear masks, aren't readily available. As Omar Devagi Pacheco found out, there is no shortage. The clear masks just aren't being stocked by the most popular retailers. But it definitely covers everything, and as you can see, it shows the whole face. Dr. Francine Rusi Layton is a big advocate for clear masks. Not just so she can see her clients' emotional responses during psychotherapy, but because she also needs to read their lips. Because Dr. Rusi is deaf. If I point at my hearing aids, then people go, oh, she really is, you know. Most people don't believe it. it it's not a visible disability. And that is part of the challenge. My worst nightmare at the beginning of COVID wasn't catching COVID. It was catching COVID and going to the hospital and people talking to me behind masks and me not being able to say anything because I can't breathe and they don't know I'm deaf. She's had to ask cashiers and other service providers to remove their masks so that she can read their lips. It's terrible, it's terrible. <laughs> it makes it very challenging for people like me to be able to hear um, what they're saying. She's concerned for vulnerable residents living with dementia in a world where they can no longer understand what's going on and perplexed as to why even her local hearing center has not adopted masks for the hearing impaired. Well, I call this one a lip reading mask and I call that one the clear mask, you know, the full face mask, if you will. That mask started as a request from a hearing impaired organization to the Como Foundation in Mississauga who made the masks. 
Max Kukiela and Sarah Vino thought it was a one-off. We weren't expecting this. In three months, we came from... The dining room table, then took the entire basement. Thousands of masks later... We drive around the city and outline areas and drop up packages for them to sew. And it, it gives them an income as well. They, like Dr. Rusi, say society needs to catch up. Why can't we buy these at Canadian Tire? Why can't we buy these at Costco? They're being mass produced. You can buy a case of 10,000 tomorrow and get it delivered. Why aren't any of the stores carrying them? They are slightly more expensive, but in a way, priceless too. That smile, the power of a smile. It's too bad we have to mask that right now. Omar Debeggy Pacheco, CBC News, Ottawa. Another country joins the Mars mission. We'll tell you who it is and when they'll get there. Coming up. Just coming up on quarter to seven, a shuttle from Port of Vancouver on this warm summer evening on the south coast. And it looks like we're in for a decent stretch of uh, good weather. Johanna's got the forecast next. When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. 
Well, today was a history-making moment for the United Arab Emirates. Yeah, the country's first mission to Mars got underway today. A space probe was launched on a Japanese rocket and is now making a 500 million kilometer flight to the Red Planet. The probe will orbit Mars to study its weather and climate. It's set to arrive next February at the same time as events marking the 50th anniversary of the Middle East nation. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how to videos, and more. Now, speaking of space, the woman who always has her eye on the sky, our meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is back. So, Joe, time's running out to catch sight of that comet. Hey, I've been seeing lots of it. Clear skies, good time for it right now. Mm -hmm. We could not have more perfect weather to line up for Neowise Comet viewing. But yeah, the clock is ticking. We have two more nights before the comet will start booking it out of the solar system. And it is getting slightly dimmer each night as the sun uh, burns off that ice associated with the comet. So you can actually see behind me a couple hours after sunset, 10, 15 p.m. seems to be that sweet spot right around here off towards the northwest section of the sky. And then as the night progresses, the comet will sort of move off towards the northeast. So if you're getting up extra early to see it, uh, look towards the northeast. If you can get away from light pollution, do so. But this is what you might end up catching. Take a look at this time lapse uh, from Robin Leslie uh, through the uh, comet from that overnight. And again, you can see on the left side of the cool. screen as that comet dances towards the right side. I know, just beautiful. <laughs> you too may catch a shot uh, this gorgeous if you uh, stay up late or get up early. Binoculars would be great, but you should be able to see it with the uh, naked eye as well. I've got to tell you, I have yet to see it myself. I've stayed up a couple of nights to try and catch it. A little too much light pollution here, so I'm going to try tonight. I'll keep you posted. It is going to be another gorgeous evening and weather will line up for the next couple of nights as well. Take a look at the temperatures at 23 and through Vancouver right now at 29 and through uh, Kelowna. Wanted to show you the big picture across the country because we've got the heat this time. Finally on the uh, right side of the ridge, so to speak. Uh, temperatures will come down a degree or two as we get into uh, that cold front that's sweeping across the province. Uh, it is bringing showers, as I mentioned earlier, to the interior. We're seeing rain in through northern sections, but watch as that front gets down to Metro Vancouver. Uh, the, sh the rain really doesn't impact uh, the south coast at all. We may see a few showers up towards Port Hardy, possibly Tofino, but generally dry, just a few more clouds through tomorrow morning, so our ridge really holding strong. Uh, taking you through the long range forecast, wanting to keep an eye on that fire danger. Just notice how a couple of days and already seeing some uh, yellows and reds, uh, not reds, sorry, yellows and oranges peak in through the south. And with temperatures like this in the forecast for the interior, definitely uh, something to keep an eye on because our long range for the southern half of the province will continue to remain seasonal and sunny. So 23 tomorrow, uh, back down to that 22s and 21s for the rest of the week, but sunshine as far as the eye can see. Well, we like that view. Thanks a lot, Joe. Well, wearing glasses and a mask these days can pose a problem. Coming up, how to avoid fogging up during the pandemic.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Don't miss Bill Reed Gallery's exhibit to speak with a golden voice. It brings a fresh perspective to Bill Reed's legacy through rarely seen treasures, personal stories, and newly commissioned works. Pre-book your tickets at billreedgallery.ca and join the early edition for the search for Metro Vancouver's Best Neighbourhood. Vote at cbc.ca slash bestneighbourhood and see if your hood will take home the title. Well, a day after slicing away a fishing net tangled around the head and body of a gargantuan sperm whale, final rescue efforts have slowed. Italian authorities say the animal's agitation is making it more dangerous to clear the net, confining its four-meter-wide flukes. It was first spotted off the coast of Sicily on Saturday, struggling to get free. The net has been identified as the type used to illegally catch swordfish. And what we're about to show you might look like a walking egg yolk or a lemon with legs. But it's actually a rarely seen yellow turtle. There it is. It was picked up by forest authorities about 150 kilometers southwest of Kolkata, well inland of the Bay of Bengal. Local residents in East India spotted the oddity and flagged it to the wildlife warden there. Experts say it's likely an albino mutation of a common turtle found in that area. It looks like mango pudding. <laughs> <laughs> not to be eaten, though. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, if you regularly wear glasses, it can be a challenge to also wear a mask without your glasses fogging up. So our colleagues at CBC Prince Edward Island decided to check with an expert to get some tips on avoiding the annoyance. My name is Carolyn Acorn. I'm president of the PEI Association of Optometrists and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about wearing a mask to minimize fogging with your glasses. You have to know your outside from your inside and usually the outside of a mask, if it's a disposable or a commercial one, will have a colored side. Sometimes there's a texture difference. There'll be a piece of metal or plastic in the top of it and the bottom won't have anything. You want to take the nose piece and balance it on the bridge of your nose and then take the bottom and wrap it under your chin like so and then take the ear pieces and then you have it centered on your face and you want to make sure then that you get the metal nose piece as tightly conformed to your face as you can and that will minimize the amount of air that can come up through the mask to your glasses. If you've got a loose space here you can either use a filler to try and prevent the air from coming up. Or sometimes people can take their glasses and overlap the edge of the mask and use the glasses to actually pinch the edge of the mask down. There are products that you can get, commercial products like fog blocker that you can wipe onto your lenses and they do work. There are things that you can do, including taking some suds when you're washing your hands and to put the suds right on the lenses, don't rinse it off and just polish it right into the lenses. But you have to be careful not to make the lenses too smeared because if the glasses are smeary, then you've defeated the point of wearing the glasses. And if you can do that, control your breathing, then you're protecting your family and friends and that's what it's all about. Huh. Good tips. Use that uh, technique for hockey masks. Oh, well. there you go. Yes. Mm, very smart. And just a quick reminder before you go, uh, we can always see this newscast online at cbc.ca slash bc. And next local news at 11 after the National of Danbert. Good night. Good night.